Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you to those who are joining us online or who will be listening later on Kansas Public Radio. My name is Vitaly Chernetsky, like my colleague Alexander Wolo, who uh, spoke during the previous hour. I am a professor in the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Languages and Literatures here at the University of Kansas. I was born in Ukraine in the city of Odessa, which is the big port city on the coast of the Black Sea. And I've been in the US for a long time now. I came as an exchange student in 1989 and uh, stayed on graduate school. And I've been teaching here at KU since 2013. So while uh, Alexandra focused on her presentation on current events, on what has been going on, um, I will focus on my remarks on history and factors from the past to help us better understand this conflict and to help in the mission of us getting a more nuanced understanding of both uh, objective facts of history and also dangerous uh, and malicious misinterpretations and manipulations of Ukraine's history that is now strategically being used by Russia's president and Russia's government to wage war on Ukraine. So this is one of those cases where history is not abstract and history has very concrete and tangible impact on the present. But before we go to history, also a little bit of basic geography, you see here a map of Ukraine which shows the diversity of its geographical landscape. And you will also see that Ukraine has few natural barriers on its borders. The high mountains that uh, it has are either in the far west, the Ukrainian portion of the Carpathian Mountains, or now in the Russian annexed Crimea. Uh, there are some uh, highlands, but they're also in the center of the country. So most of the border to the east and the north is through flatlands. And this is one of the facts, of course, that the invaders are now exploring. The geography is also a factor of history since ancient history because Ukraine was a land that was uh, impacted profoundly by many migrations historically of different ethnic groups along its territory. And this is something that it was an important part of its identity. So to talk about Ukrainian history, uh, we need also to remember that Ukraine's past uh, has uh, a lot, in many ways, linked it with other colonized states. Ukraine, for much of its history, was a colonial possession of two of several empires, most importantly in more recent history, the Russian and Soviet empire, and for a portion of the country, the Habsburg empire. And there were several brief periods of independence, one in 17th century and one in the early 20th century between 1917 and 1921. And uh, another huge factor here is uh, the tragedy of Holodomor, which is the uh, artificial famine that was the product of uh, the official policies of the Soviet state under Stalin's rule in 1932-33. Uh, the disastrous uh, attempt to squeeze all food, especially grain, from Ukrainian producers, 
and Ukraine has some of the world's richest uh, agricultural soil, uh, the kind of soils that we can only find in very few places around the world, mostly in southern Ukraine and central Ukraine in a vertical band here in the higher plains stretching from Kansas to Alberta and a small portion in Argentina south of Buenos Aires. So this is also, in that sense, another geographic uniqueness factor. But despite those rich natural riches, uh, even by the most conservative estimates of demographers, nearly four million people died of that famine. And that, of course, is a tremendously traumatic experience that generated a profound multi-generational trauma that uh, Ukrainians uh, up until recently had difficulty to address because even talking about it out loud uh, during the years of Soviet rule was forbidden. So even though this is something that impacted each and every family that lived then on the territory of Soviet ruled part of Ukraine, this is something that they could not speak about out loud for many, many years. And it's only uh, in the very final years of Soviet rule, and especially since you, after Ukraine attained independence, that open discussion of that became possible. But I'll talk more about this later. So I will also cover, as we go forward, the impact of World War II, the Chernobyl disaster of 1986, and the more recent history. And facts, uh, just a few facts sort of by, that are important to emphasize because even as the crisis before the actual outright invasion was gathering, on the mental maps of many people, uh, Ukraine was somehow small. It, the word small was used repeatedly in mass media to describe Ukraine. Ukraine is not a small country. Ukraine is larger in territory than any other country in Europe except for Russia, which is partially in Europe, partially in Asia. Um, Ukraine is just a little smaller than Texas, where it's about the size of all of California and half of Nevada. And uh, as I mentioned before, it is indeed the uh, breadbasket of Europe, a place with one of the richest uh, agricultural soils. And the lands of Ukraine have been an important source of wheat and other grains to other parts of the world since at least documented times since the days of ancient Greece, but possibly much earlier. And today, Ukraine is uh, one of the world's leading agricultural producers of a lot of commodities. Uh, sunflower have also been mentioned uh, early on in our discussion. So Ukraine is the largest producer of sunflower oil in the world. And this, of course, if the war lasts and uh, into the time for, for the spring sowing campaign, this can have really disastrous consequences globally on the impact uh, for um, the availability of many food staples around the world. A lot of countries around the world, including many countries in the Middle East, for example, are heavily dependent on Ukrainian grain. And uh, so this can have very profound implications. I've mentioned also that it's a major hub of east-west and north-south trade routes. And the situation now, of course, with the uh, natural gas pipelines uh, supplying gas from Russia to Europe, this is something that has been cynically exploited and used as a blackmail tool by the Russian government now for many years. And another important reason why Ukraine is such a coveted prize uh, is that it is a land rich in mineral resources. It did have significant oil and gas uh, deposits discovered, but because they were discovered much earlier than, say, in Siberia, where most of 
Russia's oil and natural gas now comes from, those supplies have been depleted. But um, similarly, coal was also disrupted. But there are many other things, including uranium, notably, and a lot of other things. But it is important not to just look at Ukraine as territory. A lot of imperial uh, states and uh, totalitarian regimes uh, specifically were interested in Ukraine for its territory, not for its people. This was one of the reasons uh, Nazi Germany was so intent on capturing Ukraine during World War II. But Ukraine is first and foremost its people, and it has a highly educated population, uh, has a legacy of a really significant industrial development. Much of it started by British industrialists who uh, built uh, factories in Ukraine in the second half of the 19th century. And from the Soviet days, it also inherited many uh, military industry operations, such as the Yuzhmash factory in Dnipro, Dnipro former Dnipropetrovsk, where the Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles were manufactured. And one of the questions we often have is how old are you, you know, is the Ukrainian nation? When did the Ukrainians understand that they were Ukrainians? And um, one of the cynical manipulative narratives that have been uh, emanating out of uh, Russia since bef well before the Soviet Union was established was is that Ukraine is an artificial a creation uh, dreamt up by bureaucrats in Vienna because uh, they so feared the Habsburg Empire. And of course, this is completely ludicrous, but, uh, and, but we need to understand that all nations, as we know them in modern sense, as imagined communities of people who identify with a national identity, is a relatively modern phenomenon and it dates back to the French Revolution and the American Revolution. So we're only talking about, about uh, 225 to 150 years. So yes, in that modern sense, Ukraine uh, has that long of a history, but the same is true for France, for Russia, for the United States, and for other countries. It does not make Ukraine lesser in any respect. Um, so what we think of and what, uh, as we try to understand and conceptualize Ukrainian history, is that there were past approaches. They tend to concentrate on the study of the ethnic group that came to identify itself as Ukrainian, where it came from, how it took shape. Um, and this is, again, a, a process that is shared uh, by many other countries around Europe and around the world. Think of uh, Eugene Weber's famous book, Peasants into Frenchmen, uh, as a, just one example of how this process uh, uh, proceeded in another European country. Uh, so looking at the ethnic group and its consciousness is one kind of thing. A different one, uh, a different approach has been just to look at the history of the land and many different ethnic groups that inhabited this land at different period. But uh, we now uh, look at Ukraine differently because uh, we have the present day diverse multi-ethnic in the quote that I have here from Professor Sergei Kelchik's Ukraine Birth of a Modern Nation, a multinational Ukrainian state. Um, it is, of course, a conscious project, so it's an effort to build a modern identity, but it does not make it any less legitimate because, indeed, all nations are results of that kind of con conscious projects that are pursued by many different uh, groups, uh, and there, of course, are active members of the intellectual elite who are you know, taking a prominent part within that, and a lot of ordinary folk. So, again, here, I think this is a quote from Yekelchik that would be helpful. 
It is not the case of a pre-existing Ukrainian nationality acquiring the state structures to which it, long, uh, it had long been entitled. Rather, a modern Ukrainian national identity itself was being shaped by state structures, state structures by states that control the territory, political events and social processes unfolding in Eastern Europe during the last three centuries. So that is um, Ukraine as a modern nation state did not come of age on its own, but was made by politicians, writers, and civic activists, as well as by warlords and bureaucrats and faraway imperial capitals. This is a complex process that many other uh, countries around the world can relate to. So the conflict that escalated into the tragic war that we're experiencing now reaches back into history, and so I will dive a little deeper into the history. So one of the uh, things that has been very confusing for a lot of people is that there was a major medieval kingdom in Eastern Europe that uh, ascended to its highest prominence in the 10th 11, uh, through 13th century that came known to be as Rus, and because its capital was in Kyiv, it was called Kievan Rus. Uh, the complicating thing is that with Kyiv as a capital, uh, its uh, territory extended to cover also all of what is now Belarus and por a portion of what is now Russia. The, but the name Russia does not, is not the same thing as the name Rus. Uh, so we do not have, therefore, a smooth evolution. Rather, what happens is that there are three modern nations that are in complicated, mediated ways claiming that heritage and um, in the state with its capital in Moscow is not in any way more entitled than that heritage than uh, modern Ukraine or modern Belarus. Uh, however, what happened rather is with the rise of the Muscovite state in the 17th century, it was uh, members of the educated elite, and ironically, many of them came from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, in fact, most of them, that is, they were Ukrainian or Belarusian by background, that helped shape that narrative. So uh, the Muscovite state uh, came to think of itself as Russia, only in the late 17th and especially early 18th century. So we have a gap of more than half a millennium or about half a millennium between that medieval predecessor state and modern Russia. And so by, uh, uh, there's no, by no means uh, dir direct claim can be laid on that heritage by Russia exclusively. However, the rhetoric around it and the uh, fact that the root Rus is close to the word Ruski in the Russian language, um, this has certainly impacted the narrative. But uh, the relationship within the other countries like Ukraine is no less legitimate in its claim, and uh, in fact, the relationship between the word Rus and uh, modern state of Ukraine has something that has been um, researched and talked about at length by many historians. So the, in the 19th century, uh, early 20th century, in some parts of Ukraine, they continued using the word Ruski which has had completely different meaning from the similarly sounding Russian language word Ruski. And uh, uh, especially in closely related languages, such as Slavic languages, uh, there are a lot of what are known as translators' false friends, uh, 
the phrase originally is in French, for the du traducteur. So for instance, uh, the word that means uh, fresh in Czech means stale in Ukrainian, or for instance, uh, the word uh, that means to memorize in Ukrainian and Russian means to forget in Polish. So the word that looks and sounds almost the same can mean absolutely opposite things. So the similarity of the sounding of the words does not uh, necessarily imply that there is the same meaning behind them. So on this map, I'm not sure how well you can see, the white outline is the modern borders of Ukraine, and then we see uh, several uh, principalities into which the Kievan Rus state broke, like many other uh, early medieval kingdoms in the 12th, 13th century. Uh, in the middle of the 13th century, uh, the Rus state was invaded by uh, the Mongols, and that, of course, profoundly impacted the territory. So much of Rus, uh, most of it came under Mongol rule, but different parts of it had a different time of that rule, a different, uh, depending on the territory. So what is now Ukraine had a very short period. What is now Russia, the portions of Russia, had a much longer period of Mongol rule. Most of Ukrainian lands came uh, to be under the possession of the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania in the 14th century, so less than a century after the Mongol inv uh, invasion. And then there was a dynastic union when the Grand Duke of Lithuania married the Queen of Poland and those two countries became the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Interestingly enough, once the union took place, they redrew the borders between uh, the, uh, the autonomous Lithuania and Poland within the Commonwealth. And so Ukraine, uh, almost entirely its territory, came under Polish part of the Commonwealth, while modern Belarus, the Lithuanian part of the Commonwealth, and you see this in the uh, border between the uh, darker pink and the yellow part of the map. And then in the pale pink on the east, you see uh, the Ukrainian territories that uh, the uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth lost in the middle of the 17th century. So we are speaking about several centuries of uh, Ukrainian lands, m most of them, except for a portion to the south that became part of the Ottoman Empire, um, that were part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, that uh, uh, were therefore part of the broader European continuum that experienced the Renaissance, uh, the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, uh, and oh, this is also uh, one of the sources of profound ethnic diversity of Ukrainian lands because the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was very tolerant of different diasporas, much more so than countries to its west in Europe, which is one of the reasons why these lands have such a large Jewish community established there, but uh, they were not the only important diaspora. The Armenian diaspora was prominently present. The Greek diaspora after the fall of the Byzantine Empire and many, many other groups. And it is this diversity and those events of the Counter-Reformation that precipitated a bigger crisis within the polish Lithuanian Commonwealth that had a profound impact because uh, since uh, Ukrainians, uh, like many other Slavs, they adopted, it, well, it was before the split between Eastern and Western Orthodoxy, they adopted Christianity from the East, from Constantinople. 
And therefore, once the Eastern and Western Christianity split in uh, the middle of the 11th century, they came to be known to be as Eastern or Orthodox Christian as opposed to Roman Catholic. Uh, and if you look at this map, it shows you uh, the situation in the 16th century where the green are the territories with Eastern Christian, majority Eastern Christian population. The yellow are the territories with the majority Roman Catholic population. And the blue and the purple are the areas where the Reformation made serious advances. So like elsewhere in Europe, the counter-Reformation efforts were led by the Catholic Church. And uh, it was not only directed in their case against uh, reformed uh, Christian uh, denominations, but they also were hoping to bring back into the fold, in their understanding, some of the Eastern Christians. And therefore, uh, we have the event that happened in 1596, uh, the Union of Brest, that uh, established a, an element of a different kind of a Christian church that has impacted history profoundly ever since then. And that is what is known as Greek Catholic Church. That is a church that recognizes the Pope uh, in Rome as its head, but it retains Eastern Christian liturgy and Eastern Christian rules, such as a non-celibate clergy. So there is celibate and non-celibate clergy. Uh, the non-celibate clergy are parish priests, and you can only serve as a parish priest either as a married man or as a widower. Um, so, and that has been retained. And uh, the Greek Catholic Church would later play a very important role in the national identity project in the second half of the 19th century and onward. But it was this situation, uh, the Union of Brest, that some clergy accepted and others did not, uh, created a strong tension that would tip into what in Poland was known as Wojna Domowa, the Civil War, or the flood of the 17th century, where in addition to the Civil War, there was also a Swedish invasion of the, from the North, so very turbulent 17th century. And within this 17th century period, one of the big parts was the Ukrainian Cossack uprising and the establishment of an independent Cossack state where you can see it on this map outlined in pale green. And uh, this is a state that existed for roughly two decades. So the question would be, who are the Cossacks, where they came from, and what happened to the Ukrainian Cossacks uh, who were such a prominent identity? They even mentioned in the national anthem, as you heard uh, from my colleague, Professor Alexandra Wolo earlier. Uh, the Cossacks were uh, frontier uh, warriors uh, living in the prairie lands uh, along the southern borders of uh, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, and uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the etymology of the word is uncertain, but uh, folks link it to the word uh, of a similar sound uh, that meant. Uh, uh, horseman, sort of a person riding a horse in many Turkic languages, and indeed they were on horseback. And so this was a very interesting culture because they had their homes and their families in the settled areas, but they also uh, would establish this all male or nearly all male warrior republic along this uh, region in the far south east uh, of this territory, as a Prisja, and uh, therefore the historically Ukrainian Cossacks were also known as uh, Zaporizhsky Kozaki, uh, 
Zaporizhian or Zaporozhian Cossacks. Uh, those are, uh, were the, this is the oldest community of Cossacks, but Cossacks were also established on the southern, southeastern edges of the Muscovite state that in the future would become the Russian Empire. And what happened is that later in history, the Ukrainian Cossacks would be suppressed and banned and deported and basically eliminated as a community by the Russian state in the 18th century, primarily during the rule of Catherine the Great, while the Russian Cossacks were not. So the Cossacks that we see and know and identify as Cossacks, for instance, in the early 20th century, those would not be Ukrainian Cossacks. Those would be Russian Cossacks from the areas further east than Ukraine within the Russian Empire. And uh, however, there was a portion of Ukrainian Cossacks that were allowed to stay Cossacks as long as they left Ukrainian lands. And those are the Kuban Cossacks in North Caucasus. Uh, but there we have a complicated story already in the 20th century where an intensive pressure to Russify and to uh, drop the Ukrainian identity um, was uh, conducted and it started in force in the 1930s at the same time as the terror famine of Holodomor that impacted the Kuban region in the North Caucasus um, similarly to Ukraine. So uh, one of the, so you, so you see this state and its outlines and this is an independent uh, state uh, that was able to regulate its own life, uh, conduct treaties, send ambassadors and receive ambassadors from other countries um, for about 20 years or so. But it was engaged in conflict on all three sides, that is with the polish Lithuanian Commonwealth with the, with the Ottoman Empire in its vassal state, the Crimean Khanate, and with the Muscovite state in, to the northeast. And it started from the uprising that, as I said, was uh, the result of the pressure uh, of a counter-reformation. So the important part for the Cossack state was association with Eastern Christianity. And therefore, when the situation became dire, uh, they looked to the only major remaining Eastern Orthodox Christian nation uh, that was independent, left in the world at the time, and that was Muscovy, the Muscovite state to the northeast of them, as all the other Eastern Orthodox lands were either under Ottoman or under Polish rule. So they signed a treaty known as uh, the Treaty of Perayaslav, based on the city where the treaty was signed. And you see the picture here is a Soviet propaganda uh, poster from 1954 when they were marking the 300th anniversary of that treaty. And of course, you see here uh, a Russian man in the front and a Ukrainian man a little further behind him. And the caption in Russian says, together forever. And this is the problem we had in that treaty, a misunderstanding and miscommunication uh, between two states with very different cultures. Ukrainians, uh, their culture came from the polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, which had a parliament a parliament of nobles, uh, so a very small procession, per percentage of the country's population had voting rights, but it was still a parliament. It was a democracy and it was equality. Poland had an elected king and um, all of the by then advanced European ideas about personal identity and national identity and the rights uh, were firmly established in the polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. By contrast, in its political culture, the Muscovite state is a direct descendant of the uh, Mongol Empire uh, 
and its later breakaway westernmost uh, daughter states, the Golden Horde, and that is an absolutely, it's an absolutist top-down society. So what uh, Ukrainians took as a treaty between two equals about friendship and cooperation, uh, the Muscovites interpreted as Ukrainians willingly subjugating themselves to the rule of the Russian Tsar. So when uh, the Muscovite state within a few years broke the treaty, uh, the Ukrainian Cossack state uh, found the treaty that, you know, to be null and void and started pursuing other alliances. But um, by then, the a Russian, uh, you know, the Muscovite, the future Russian Empire state was on the ascendant and therefore it was able in the war with the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth to capture significant territory and partition Ukraine in half, as you see here. So the pale uh, pink lands were the ones that came under Muscovite rule. But even as a divided country for much of the 17th century, Ukraine was uh, a place that was undergoing through a major cultural renaissance. It was the cultural center of the Eastern Christian world. Kiev was known as a Jerusalem of the North because of its significant learning. It had the only, uh, the, fir uh, the first university in Orthodox Christian lands, the Kiev Mahila Academy, established in 1632. Uh, the Muscovite state had no universities. And uh, so this was a place of great education and many achievements. And so what happened is in the reform of the Muscovite state in the final decades of the 17th century, uh, there was a strong brain drain from Kyiv. Some ambitious uh, people, uh, mostly men, uh, went uh, to Moscow of their own free will to make a career, but many were taken there by force. If they were now living under Muscovite ruled lands they had, in this absolute monarchy state, they had no choice. And this included a prominent cleric, uh, Danilo Tuptovo, who later was canonized in Eastern Christianity as Saint Dimitri of Rostov. So, uh, so this is what was happening in the late 17th, 18th century. Uh, you see on the map uh, the parts of Ukraine that were autonomous uh, for a portion of that time, uh, late 17th century up until 1709, then the autonomy was abolished, then was briefly reestablished, and then was finally abolished in 1764. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, the Zaporozhian Cossack host was liquidated and dispersed in 1775. And what happened is we had the enslavement or ensurfment of Ukrainian peasantry. Russia, uh, the Muscovite state was a serf-owning state, so serfs are basically slaves without uh, racial difference. So uh, the peasant population does not have rights. They are owned and can be bought and sold by their owners. And uh, so the serfdom, uh, expanded to include Ukrainian lands in 1783. We also need to understand uh, the term uh, that uh, is used often in Russian imperial discourse and which was sometimes uncritically translated uh, and used in other languages. And that is uh, the calling uh, Ukraine Malorossia or Malorossia uh, and uh, Russia, Velika Russia, Velika Russia, and uh, Belarus, or Belarus in Russian, and Nova Russia, New Russia. So uh, these are the terms uh, that uh, also came into use in the second half of the 17th century. First of all, Ro, uh, Ro with an O is the influence of Greek. So uh, so it was Mikra Rosia and Makra Rosia, and so Rus was interpreted as Rosia by the Greeks, and so Mikra Rosia, the 
Little Rus were the lands closer, the historical core of Rus. But and uh, Makra is the larger area, sort of further out to the outskirts. B so the same ways as the Greece, uh, Mikra Elada, Makra Elada was this small Greece is the core Greece and the large Greece is Greece uh, dis dispersed all over the Mediterranean area. But the big little was reinterpreted in terms of power relations, like big brother, little brother. And this is where the confusion comes. And then Novorossiya, that the term that Putin was using actively in 2014, and then it went away, so far hasn't resurfaced actively, is new Russia, and let's think of it like New England here in the United States, and that is the territories that the Russian Empire conquered from the Ottoman Empire in the final decades of the 18th century uh, were named in the Russian discourse as Novorossiya. So uh, the territories um, of Ukraine after the three partitions of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, they came, most of them, under Russian imperial rule, and a small portion came under the, the Habsburg rule, Austrian, and since 1867, Austro-Hungarian Empire. So the uh, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth weakened as a state and was carved out by three um, kingdoms, uh, Russia, Prussia, and Austria, through three partitions in 1772, 1793, and 1795. The partition of 1772 only uh, affected those Western Ukrainian lands that came under Habsburg rule, uh, but the later two partitions uh, took the air territories of Ukraine that were not yet under Russian rule, under Russian rule. So we therefore have a situation where the majority of the country is under the rule of one large empire, but a significant chunk is at the rule of another empire. So we have a national identity and unity that is split among those two empires and a very tense border, but nevertheless there is a lot of cultural dialogue and the presence of those to empires is important in the future development of the modern Ukrainian nation because some civic activities are possible at some times in one empire and not the other. So uh, to look at some 19th century con uh, contexts of Ukraine and the imagination of Ukraine, and this is uh, something that historians have talked about a lot, is that Ukraine was being processed and viewed by other cultures as through analogy. So as you see on the left here, the stereotypes, Ukraine was simultaneously thought of as Russia's Italy and Poland's Scotland. And you would argue that Italy and Scotland are very different cultures, that how could one place be similar to Italy and similar to Scotland simultaneously? Well, it, the stereotypes for Poland, it was like you know Scotland in the novels of Sir Walter Scott, a place of ancient tradition, a lot of mystery, of warriors, Cossacks, of hospitality, of romanticism, and so on and so forth. For the Russian Empire, it was a warm southern land with fertile soil, with cheerful people, good food, who liked to sing and dance a lot. So a very shallow stereotype. Even the great Russian uh, national poet Alexander Pushkin, in one of his more unfortunate phrases, referred to Ukrainians as pleme payushe i pleashushe, the singing and dancing tribe. And unfortunately, those kind of stereotypes are, uh, have impacted the Russian cultural imagination for a very long time. So, and this is this shallow stereotypical perception of Ukraine, Ukrainian identity, and Ukrainian culture uh, that we see on the Russian side, which is much, and a much more nuanced one on the Polish side, even though there are two can occasionally be problems, is that there's a lot of uh, folks in Russia who profess to love Ukraine and Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian people, and um, when they are pressed more to, so what exactly do they love and what aspects of Ukrainian culture they find uh, 
most important and exciting and dear, they very soon run out of anything concrete to say, and it's mostly reduced to Ukrainian food or Ukrainian folk songs. Uh, so yes, that very shallow stereotype. And uh, another uh, writer um, who is very important in the story of how an image of Ukraine came to be very strong in the Russian imagination was Mikola Hohol, or Nikolai Gogol, uh, the man on the left here, and I will talk about more of him in a second, and that is his revolution as a writer is important for us to understand both Ukrainian self-identity and Ukrainian identity as it is presented in the Russian colonial discourse in the 19th century. So, and we have uh, two uh, very different interpretations of Ukrainian uh, nation and Ukrainian culture within the broader community of Slavic nations. And in the 19th century, we have an intellectual and political trend known as Slavophilism that was mostly started by Czech and Slovak intellectuals in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but uh, this was something that was also uh, exploited by the Russian uh, imperial uh, discourse. Uh, so, again, a line from Pushkin, So, will the Slavic streams merge into Russian sea? So, for, the, for Russia, it's not an equal a gathering of Slavic nations, but Russia very much as the sea, the dominant one into which all those little s streams of other Slavic cultures have to flow and merge. And this uh, relates to what was known in Russia as the policy of official nationality, официальная народность, proclaimed by Count Uvarov. Ukrainians, by contrast, see it as a free c confederation of equals. Uh, Federation of Free Slavic Nations and the underground organization known as the Cyrilla Methodian Brotherhood. Oh, I see I've been talking very, very long. I apologize. Um, there's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, was uh, a envisioned this kind of equality in the famous lines from Taras Shevchenko, Ukraine's national poet. Uh, Ukraine was looking for its own Washington with a new and righteous law. Russia, by contrast, uh, started actively suppressing all aspects of Ukrainian identity in very repressive ways in, since 1863. So we see these two men in the 19th century that epitomize the difference in the development of modern identity. On the left is Mikolo Hohol or Nikolai Gogol, somebody you probably are more familiar with as a writer. But on the other, on the right, you will see Another wonderful writer, primarily a poet, Taras Shevchenko, Ukraine's national poet. Uh, you may have seen statues of him in uh, many places around the world. There is one in Washington, D.C., there is one in Cleveland, Ohio, and in many other places. But he deserved to be known not just as a man, as an icon, but also as a visionary poet. So in Google's case, he created sort of this hybrid colonial identity where he was performing Ukrainianness for the Russian imperial gaze, while uh, Shevchenko was this passionate poet who uh, scholars have discussed as having an adjusted and unadjusted self. So he had his outward career as a visual artist in uh, the Russian Empire, but his poetry was something that is oriented towards creating a sense of both national identity and of also solidarity of the colonized. This is why Shevchenko is so important. He can be seen as a anti-colonial thinker, an anti-colonial creative person many decades earlier than any such sentiments were articulated in other cultures. So the history of repressions that started en masse uh, in the second half of the 19th century, the two um, landmarks of that were the two Russian imperial decrees, the Voluyev Circular of 1863 and the Ems Edict of 1876. And as you see, the very significant bands, 
1863 was a ban of the publication of education on religious materials in Ukrainian. So in other words, schools had to teach only in Russian, and it was actually a translation of the New Testament into modern vernacular Ukrainian that prompted the Tsarist uh, government to ban uh, the use of uh, the language. Uh, the Ems Edict of 1876 uh, went much, much further, a complete ban on the publication uh, in Ukrainian of scholarly or literary works and of translations from other languages. It's not a legitimate language. You cannot translate into it in the view of the Russian government. There was a ban on theater performances, public readings, and any and all education in Ukrainian. Ukrainian language and books were removed from libraries, and the very words Ukraine and Ukrainian were forbidden from use in print. You could only use this little Russian, Malorossiyski, or Southern Russian terms in public use, which is why Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony was known as Malorossiyska Symphonia in Russian because it used Ukrainian folk music elements. And unfortunately, it is still often uh, in English is called the Little Russian Symphony. It's neither little nor Russian. It's a symphony based on Ukrainian music. And here you can see the only uh, serious census that was undertaken in the Russian Empire in 1897. And interesting enough, they separated. They understood that Ukrainian was a separate identity. So they counted all the Eastern Slavs together and then separately Ukrainians and uh, Belarusians. And we, you can see that the territories with majority Ukrainian population stretch far beyond the uh, territories of the modern Ukrainian state. And here we see the ethnic diversity of the Habsburg Empire and Ukrainians uh, in orange to the northeast. Again, very significant chunk and somewhat coinciding with modern borders of Ukraine in that region, but also stretching a little bit beyond that. And of course, the important thing to mention is the very large and very important Jewish community that remained in that, uh, those lands. And this is how Russian Empire got its Jewish community through the partitions of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. There was not a significant Jewish presence in the Muscovite state. And the Jews were restricted from moving from the borders of the former Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which came to be known as the Pale of Settlement. So uh, in the interest of time, I will uh, speak a little faster. Uh, the uh, collapse of the Russian Empire in 1917, uh, first is the end of monarchy, uh, the February Revolution of 1917 led to the end of the monarchy, uh, Russia uh, becomes a re republic, and uh, this multi-ethnic empire sees a lot of colonized nations actively pushing for independence, Ukraine is one of them, Easter 1917 is an important event of this kind. Uh, this is very similar to the struggle for independence that Ireland is pursuing against uh, the United Kingdom at very similar times. And Ukrainians established its uh, self-governing body known as the Central Rada. Rada means council. And it was a uh, left, centrist left, led by moderate social democrats. They proclaimed Ukraine's autonomy on 23rd of June, but uh, in later in, 20, in 1917, Bolsheviks take over in Russia. And at first, there is sort of this uneasy trying to figure out what is going on. But in January uh, 1918, the Bolshevik uh, army under General Muravyov invades Ukraine. And it is under the pressure of that invasion that the Rada declares full independence of Ukraine. Ukraine was one of the three uh, signatory countries to the, of the Treaty of Brest, the peace treaty between Germany and Austria and the successor states to the Russian Empire as an equal representative, and there were not just the Bolsheviks there. And uh, with the collapse of the Habsburg Empire, a Western Ukrainian People's Republic was proclaimed on 18th of October of 1918, and it unified with the Ukrainian a People's Republic uh, on 22nd of January 1919, which is why January 22nd now in Ukraine is known as the Day of Unity. 
There were several successful governments uh, in it. Uh, the first government was uh, center-left, then it was a right-wing government from April to December of 1918, and again, social democratic-led government from December of 18 to the November of 1920, at which point the Soviets gained their control. But I see that it's almost 12 noon, so unfortunately I will have to wrap up here and I'll be happy to answer about the details of the Soviet rule period uh, in the Q&A Q uh, time of our discussion. Thank you so much for listening patiently and sorry for not pacing myself better. Yes, lots of ground to cover. I would, could have gone for another hour, but we're not going to do that. Any questions here, I'll, I'll come find you with the microphone. Um, meanwhile, if folks online have questions, feel free to enter those as well. While people are thinking of questions, I might share one with you that was shared at the very end of the last session of questions, if you don't mind. Um, and it's a question specifically about right now, um, as black residents of the Ukraine are trying to leave the, t the experiences that they are having and the way that that compares um, to other residents who are trying to leave. Um, and if you wanna contextualize or comment or respond or something, that would be great. Uh, thank you so much, this is a great question. Ukraine has, uh, it's a diverse country. It has uh, its own uh, citizens who are of multicultural backgrounds, uh, including with African background. It also hosts uh, as a very educated country at its universities, many foreign students, including from Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. In this terrible war, an Indian student uh, has been killed by Russian shelling yesterday. Uh, the uh, foreign students, especially uh, students of color who are trying to uh, flee uh, the war zone, there has been accusation, uh, not uh, on the Ukrainian side, but uh, with the uh, border guards of neighboring countries who uh, mistreated them and uh, uh, exhibited preference towards Ukrainians who to them um, look Ukrainian, that is uh, Caucasian. That is very, very unfortunate, and this kind of ra uh, racism is really unacceptable. The good thing is that the governments of those countries uh, absolutely condemn these practices, like Poland, for example, and are working very actively to make sure that this kind of mistreatment does not happen again. There are currently, uh, very courageous people on the ground in Ukraine who are trying to help, including an African-American activist, Terrell Germain Starr. Uh, so uh, Mr. Starr has been doing really amazing work. And there is a wonderful African-American uh, young historian who is a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania, Kimberly St. Julian Varnon, who has been also doing a lot of activism. And Kimberly actually has developed a link tree of resources that specifically uh, address uh, folks of color who are now in Ukraine impacted by the war and how they can be assisted. So Ukrainian people are very much uh, assisting everyone who is now in need, and this includes folks of color. Uh, we've had some problems uh, on the Western borders uh, because of the, how the incoming refugees were treated by some of the neighboring countries.